Hello, warm welcome to every single one of you. Yay, can I have you having shaking your hands, ladies? Ladies, Monica too. <laughs> warm, warm, warm welcome to everybody, and thank you to every single one of you for being here on this webinar on empowering female leaders in 2022. So as it stands, quite a few people coming in and they will start to come in a little bit more, but we here love to start on time. <laughs> so uh, hello, how are you both beauties doing today? Good, so thank well. you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having us here. We're very excited for the conversation. Yay. Fantastic. All right. So. For everybody else who perhaps does not know me, we'll do the introductions. My name is Karina Bonion. I'm more known as Coach Karina. I'm a performance, career, developmental and life coach. I've been working with iLearn for more than 10 years and I do this with several different companies and individuals and I've been doing this on close for two decades already. I'm showing my age, I'm showing my time. It's an honor to facilitate this discussion and it's really a privilege to introduce the two phenomenal ladies today which is lauren dallas and monica singer so again warm welcome and i just want to share in the background over here give me your hand i literally have lisa holding my hand <laughs> and um she'll be helping there's always people in the background she's the head of our marketing and yes so let's get started let me just check the numbers of people so I also want to just share with you at the end of this webinar, I have a small confession to share with you all. But what we're going to do, if we can all start to do a little quick poll on how you are feeling about today. So you're on your screen, you will see how are you feeling about today. Please select one of the following. Are you totally pumped? I am. Are you excited, ambivalent, apprehensive? If every single one of you can just do that quickly and please submit. How are you feeling about today? Totally pumped, excited, ambivalent, apprehensive. <laughs> Alrighty, how is our poll coming along, Lisa? All right, excited, yay, 73%. We love that energy. Thank you, thank you, and totally pumped, great ambivalent apprehensive thank you we'll hold you for those who are feeling a bit apprehensive all right so before we begin i'm going to start something a little bit unusual coach karina is definitely unusual you'll get to know me on that side so i'd like to invite everybody to take three deep breaths but before we do it we see your faces including mine on here i would like to invite you all to close your eyes so let's close our eyes for a moment and to take three deep breaths so breathing in and breathing out. Two more. Everybody in and out. And another one in and out. And open your eyes. So thank you and thank yourselves for being here. That collectively, collaboratively, we are here to share, to learn and encourage each other and how we can keep rising and of course, to feel totally grateful for this time. So let me do a slight introduction before I let our panelists here introduce themselves. So with changes in social values, access to education and people starting families later in life, the barriers for women have been broken down considerably later in life. However, women are still expected if not required to exemplify several qualities if they wish to make their mark in business or entrepreneurship. Out of all these qualities, women's leadership is the most important. Women who demonstrate the ability to be strong leaders are significantly more likely to enjoy a successful career in business than those who don't. And fortunately, many women are finding their way through the many obstacles placed in their way, such as our lovely phenomenal guest we'll be chatting to today. As women leaders hold a key measurable impact on our organization's bottom line, good business strategies should ensure women are meaningfully represented and engaged in leadership roles. It was our intention today to have two generations of women in this webinar, so we can learn from you both, and we trust that what you both have to share will be of tremendous value. So 
here I go, asking you both to do a little introduction of three to five minutes. It's up to you um, if you want to go a little bit longer. We'll start with Lauren on alphabetical. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, this is an opportunity for the, learn, for, for the listeners to basically know who you are. Some might not know you yet and to connect with you through your story. So take it away, Lauren. Perfect. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone joining us. I'm very happy to be here. So by way of introduction, most people know me as the co-founder and CEO of Future Females. We are now just five years in business, an organization that started in Cape Town as a single event. And our mission and vision is very clear. It actually hasn't changed since day one. We exist to increase the number of female entrepreneurs globally and to support them by providing resources to build more profitable and scalable businesses. So what we actually do, there's really two sides to the organization. The first side is community. So women learn as networking people, right? And when I moved, and I'll tell you a little about my story in a minute, I didn't have a network in South Africa. This accent is, I'm actually half Welsh, half English, grew up in Australia and a New Zealand citizen. So I'm basically really in good position to win the World Cup rugby no matter which team comes out on top unless it's <laughs> Ireland um, but I've been in South Africa for six years so one side of future females is the community we create spaces physically through our events digitally and emotionally where women can connect to each other can collaborate can seek support can try in their businesses sometimes fail of course but help pick each other up and ultimately succeed um, we started in Cape Town, as I said, with a single event. We now have a presence in 56 cities around the world where empowered ambassadors, ambassadors for us are basically the face of our movement in their different cities, and they host an event or a retreat or an expo, um, whatever it is that their local community needs. So that's the one side. What we realized is that that's really important to inspire women and to showcase role models, but it wasn't tangibly moving the needle in their businesses. So then we started in the e-learning side of our business, which obviously is very familiar to you and probably everyone tuned in. Um, but we deliver programs, um, our two main programs. One is a three month accelerator that really just helps women start. So it's a combination of technical and emotional skills brought together to help them get the basic foundations in place. And then in about a month, we're launching our new platform, which is a little like a masterclass for female founders, where we're bringing stories of successful women through courses to our community. Um, so yes, that's still a work in progress. We're currently in waitlist phase, but that's what we're hustling on behind the scenes. I think just to take a minute longer and to provide some context of my career to this point, because it will come through in the questions, I've worked in tech businesses and startups uh, since I was 18. Um, I was at uni working full time at eBay on the side, my first job. Actually, my first job was delivering fertilizer samples. The company was called King Fu, uh, but not so relevant to share. Um, I then started advising a number of tech startups, started three of my own. They all failed. One was a spectacular fail that had me going back into corporate and I actually worked in management consulting for Accenture. I was the most senior female in Accenture strategy and I was also in charge of recruitment for Accenture strategy. And I'll share learnings as I go, but had so many interesting things said to me, like just put the woman through if she meets four of the criteria, but a man needs to reach seven. And I guess my response to that and how, you know, am I really supporting by doing that or, or otherwise? So then I moved because my heart is in startups, moved to South Africa, started Future Females and, and here I am. So I'll, I'll speak mostly to the entrepreneurial side because that's been the last six years of my life, but I can also reflect a little on, on those corporate experiences. Wow. <laughs> You've done all of that and you're still such a baby in terms of oh, Monica and I. Oh my God. Really. Collagen is working, Karina. <laughs> collagen in your coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you for giving us such an introduction and well done for everything you've achieved, Lauren. That's remarkable. And on and up, you keep on shining and going, us women, we're supporting you and we'll be watching you. <laughs> <laughs>
Monica, please share yourselves with us. Hello, everybody. Uh, Monica Singer. I work for the biggest blockchain company in the world. If you don't know what blockchain is, but it's the new technology that will create the internet of value. So you take the internet and now you can start transferring transactions of value that you couldn't do in the past. That will take a lift on its own. Um, how did I end up working for consensus? It's incredible. So since the time I was a very little girl, I always knew that I was going to work in areas where I would make a difference. So I come from a very dysfunctional family. So I think that I survived by having this incredible hope that when I grew older and, and, and independent and free from that family, I would be able to change a lot of this dysfunctional experiences that I had as a child. So that's why I always had at the back of my mind that anything I chose had to be something that is going to make a difference. This is very important because I wanted to realize that everything I did was with love. So every job I chose was love prevailed over salary or fame or glory or everything. So that's why they say that if you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's why I never felt that I had a job. It was just a pure passion. Um, and so, okay, so the first thing I wanted to do was to become a chartered accountant because my dad wasn't a very good businessman. So I always thought if I become an accountant, I'll help him get out of the mess that he's creating. Um, so that was driven. You see, that was love. It's just driven by something that I wanted to make a difference. Then after my articles, uh, first of all, my accent is from Spanish. I came from Uruguay. <coughs> And I came to from Uruguay 40 years ago. I'm very South African and I love South Africa. So when so then I started to be a CA after your articles. My first job was actually by choice to join the Institute of Chartered Accountants. And I was there for eight years. And it was such a beautiful time because my uh, job was to create the standards, auditing and accounting standards for the profession. And also many of the legislation. Um, were drafted by me and, and, and lobbied by me. So I, I was very passionate about changing South Africa for the better. Then I went to work for the World Bank. Just imagine that the World Bank approaches you and says, come and work for me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna go and save the world. Trust me, the World Bank didn't save anybody. So it was one of those very depressing experiences. <laughs> it was the biggest bureaucracy I've ever seen. It was terrible. And that's when I realized I need to be independent from people telling me what to do, you know, uh, because I cannot tolerate authority and I cannot tolerate people that I don't have respect to tell me what to do. So when I came back to South Africa, I was in Washington, D.C. I came back and then by chance, I was told that I should run the biggest IT project ever in this country. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not an IT person. I know zero about IT. Then it was about changing the financial markets from paper-based to electronic. I, at that time, was a socialist. Socialists don't invest in the stock market. So what did I know about the stock market? Minus zero. <laughs> so you know what? I also learned that innovation is brought by people that don't know the industry. So the fact that I didn't understand the industry was perfect because I combined my passion for making South Africa a better place with my research that I've learned at the Institute. And then I said, it doesn't matter. I don't know what's going on. I will surround myself with only the best people that knew, know what to do. I'll be the conductor of the orchestra and they can play the instruments. I just have to learn how to ask questions, to learn and to be a strong leader in that process. And that's what I did. So I created this company called Straight, S-T-R-A-T-E. It's the Central Securities Depository. I was the CEO for 20 years and it was absolutely successful to the extent that South Africa, when I started, was categorized as the worst emerging market, worse than Russia and Venezuela, imagine, in terms of uh, operational settlement risk in financial markets. By the time I left, we were amongst the top 10. We even uh, were categorized uh, at a certain stage by the World Economic Forum as the top three financial market in the world. So the legacy was humongous. And then I, I sat on many boards. Always the boards that I chose were boards where I could make a difference. You know, I'll give you an example. I'm not good at changing nappies. I admit, even though I have kids, but <laughs> the nappy stage was horrendous. So, but I love 
helping in charities. So I became the chair of one of the biggest charities in this country, Africa Tikkun, which is, um, so then I could use my expertise in finance to help a charity. So do you understand what I'm trying to explain? That you must use your talents to give back in an area where you're passionate. And so that's why they say, man, know thyself, a woman, know thyself. Once you know who you are, then your choice of what you're going to do in your life becomes natural because then you know, I'm not good at nappies, but I'm great at finance. So let me work in finance in the orphanage. That's just as an example. So eventually what happened is when um, I read the paper, I recommend everybody reads this paper. It's called Bitcoin, the white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. And when I read that paper, I literally changed my life because that paper says you don't centralize financial market, you decentralize it. So when I read that, I thought, wait a second, I built the biggest centralized register entity in the country and in the world. And now Satoshi says, I need to decentralize. I need to leave straight. So even though straight was my baby, I created it. I was a queen in a real big castle with a lot of money and wealth and okay, fortune, power. I thought, I'm leaving this and I'm gonna join the plebs and we're going to fight for the decentralization of financial markets. And that's what I've been doing for five years. I now live in Cape Town. Um, I, I work for a company that is remote only. So it's a company that has people all over the world. And we all committed to this new passion, which is going to change truly financial markets and many industries because the blockchain technology affects every, everything. It's a ledger. So anything that has a ledger, and remember I'm an accountant, so ledgers make sense. <laughs> Everything makes sense. Do you understand that? Do you see how my path, it makes sense. And, and the other thing I have to tell you is that the many boards that I sat, I resigned when I saw that either they were not ethical or they were not sticking to the values. So you don't have to stick around in a board or in a company with your values don't align to the company. You must always be true to yourself. Um, then the rest we're going to uh, cover in the questions, but I just wanted to tell you my story because the one thing that I have achieved in my life is always to be true to myself. Um, the, uh, the one thing I haven't achieved in my life, and you're going to ask me that question, and you have uh, one of the questions is, how do you achieve balance? I confess, I'm a workaholic. <laughs> There's no balance in my life, zero, zero, and my whole life has been about learning to achieve balance, which I haven't. So, um, and, the, and, the, and Karina that knows me very well, the consequence of no balance is uh, my health. So I have suffered terrible things in my life, terrible. I still survive and I will carry on surviving, but definitely I have neglected my body in many ways. So I confess, you know, yes, it's all very well, wow, 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 all the great things, but there's a dark side about what I did. So, um, yeah. Uh, Let's, let's begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I have to be honest with you. I don't know if anybody else has. I've literally got chills running down my mind. Thank God I'm wearing a, as I say in French, a col roulé, a polo neck, because my hair has stood up. Your story, it's remarkable. You inspire so many of us. Please continue to do so, Monica. And, you know, if there's one thing I, I hear from the two of you is this, Undoubtedly, and I've seen that with my years, I've been in corporate for close on 30 years, is bravery, bravery, bravery. Mm -hmm. What do women mm -hmm. need to go forward and to be in positions of leadership is definitely bravery. So I just want to tell you all and share this with you. When we did our registration poll, um, we asked the question before getting people on, was does your organization have a women's leadership development program? And I just want to share with you the results. 21% said yes. 56% said no, 16% said we are working on it, and 7% said no, uh, gave no answer. The question was, does your organization have a women's leadership development program? I thought that was interesting, and I think for the many women that will be listening to us, and the gents, because I know there are quite a few of you, thank you for joining, that's amazing, by the way. Uh, that is actually an opportunity in itself, knowing those stats. All right, so let's jump into the questions. We are a bunch of highly organized individuals and women here. So there's a beautiful structure how we're gonna to flow to this. And we decided to take questions from the audience and oh, the questions were so beautiful and we selected 
nine. Will we get through them? Let us see. I'll give an opportunity for both ladies to answer. We're going to go on alphabetical order. Isn't this funny, by the way? My first name, Karina, U L K L M. All right, so first question. Remember, this is taken from the audience prior when this webinar invite went off, and this is where we are doing this for you, our audience. So the first question is as a female entrepreneur, how do I grow my business in a male world? Do you have any pointers or strategies? Lauren, you go. Monica, you go after. Thank you. Sure. Can do and great question. Thank you. So I'll keep it fairly brief because we do have nine questions and just maybe give two tips. I think the first thing when it comes to entrepreneurship and to starting a business is actually to just start. I mean, there's 42% of women in South Africa say they want to be an entrepreneur. 10% of that actually ever get started. So the first thing I would say, and what I have learned is that starting a business or many businesses by this point is as much a personal development journey as it is the practical technical steps of getting started. And I think in the context of a woman, there's of course, you know, fear of failure, fear of success as well, but also other things like fear of, um, going against expectations of gender norms, fear of people judging you for starting a business when you could be with your kids. So I love Monica, your real, real honesty in sharing how I also expect I will be as a mother when it comes to nappies. Um, but I do think those fears come up and they end up just holding you back as a woman. And I always say like, if you have an idea, you have to start it. Like you were born with this immense creativity and so if something is lighting you up, then just give it a try. You know, an, an idea actually can't succeed or fail until you take action in it. So there's no point sitting in the fear of it not working out because it definitely won't work out if you don't start. So I think that that's, that's the first thing is just really understanding that you have the power in you to start and grow a business and trust in that first and take the steps. At Future Females, one of our principles is consistent, imperfect action. One step every day, imperfect steps, just to keep moving forwards, because that's you know where the concept of momentum comes from as well. If you're not moving forwards, you're ultimately moving backwards. The second thing that I would say is quite interesting when you start a business, because you're almost operating outside of a lot of the systems and structures in the world like you experience perhaps in a male dominated organization but at the same time if you keep operating alone then it's going to be a much harder journey for you so my second tip when it comes to growth is to sur surround yourself by a support structure and that could be mentors coaches like karina could be um, people who have just done what you've done. So if you want to raise funding, finding someone who can just be a mentor for a little while while you go through that next step. That's been really critical for me. Um, and I would say in the context of a male dominated world, and if we look at something like funding, you know, only 2.5% of VC funding went to female founded businesses. We've actually gone backwards in the last two years. You can't avoid the men and so we shouldn't. Some of my best champions have actually been men in my job, in this business. So find that support structure and of course, surround yourself by amazing women doing amazing things, but let our allies help us as well. It's the only way we're gonna all rise together. Beautiful, thank you. Monica. I, I agree, Lauren. Um, I have to tell you, like your experience is entrepreneurship. I've never been an entrepreneur in my life. I always wanted to be part of the, the traditional corporate environment because I felt that I could be the, the white light that brought values and ethics and only good things. You know, I was the first winner of, the, of a competition in South Africa called the Conscience Company Award. And I won because I didn't know that I was applying amazing principles. You know, my whole life I've been driven by people, planet, profits. So people first. My people were number one and I fought for them. And, and that's why, you know, they loved me. It was like a family. But I had to confront the most amount of evil that you can imagine. Remember that the company was owned by the stock exchange and the four big bank. Trust me, there's nothing 
uh, angelic about the stock exchange and the banks, nothing. And therefore, for them, profits is number one and everything else is number whatever. So I had to fight all the time at the board to ensure that ethics and the values and, and, and corporate governance was number one. So that uh, you confront many issues, not only the glass ceiling, you confront, you know, that you're now bringing the truth, you know, and, and the light. So um, I think that what saved me, and this is one advice that I've got, which is very similar to what Lauren has to say, what saved me all along in all the jobs that I had was that I had a sponsor. What does it mean a sponsor? A sponsor is very important. It's someone, and it's normally a man, a very influential man that will protect you. So I had two sponsors, you know, my chairman, Mervyn King, Bobby Johnston, and then Russell Lapsha, who was the CEO of the Stock Exchange. They were amazing because every time that someone wanted to fire me because they didn't like what I was doing because I was being too ethical, then they would come in and say, you're not firing her. Why would you fire her? You know? So, um, so you need a sponsor if you're going to be in a, in a corporate environment where there's a lot of uh, egos, power plays, um, and, and, you know, energy that is in, con in, in, in conflict with yours. So the other thing is the word endurance. Because you know how many times the, a decision was taken at the board that I was totally against it. But remember that the board decides, the majority vote, yes, I was a board member, but the vote goes to the vote and you are just one vote. So if you lose the vote, many times my ego will say, I'm out of here, they can, you know, and keep this job. I don't want it. And then I thought, wait a second, don't be stupid. If your e you know, ego, 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 if I let my ego decide that I have to resign, I will never achieve the goals of wanting to make South Africa a better place in the financial market. So I have to fight and stay and endure. And then eventually the truth and the, the, the light and the right decisions will be taken. So that's the other thing. I think women tend to quit too quickly. I think that we take things personal. I think that we sometimes feel victim. I didn't, you know, I was like, you know, they say, what else? <laughs> I was like, okay, fine, don't worry. I'll come back from that one. You know, you won this battle, but I'll win the war, you know? So I didn't give up, you know, and it's true. You know, that saying, it says, you only fail when you stop trying to succeed. You only fail when you stop trying to succeed. So please don't let your ego get the best of you. And the main thing is keep in your soul the reason why you're there. You know, is the reason to change the world or is the reason because you want to make money? So just remember what is guiding you to take the decision to give your time and energy, your health, your passion to a purpose. And I hope always the purpose is more than just making money because money comes. But when you sit where I'm sitting now, and I look back in the life that I had, I am happy that I made a big difference. And so I can go now in peace to think, you know what, I've, I've, I've done it. You know, I, there's nothing else that I feel that my ego needs to achieve because I left an amazing legacy. So I'm just giving you um, the examples of don't let the male energy, I call it male energy, it could actually be evil energy because it's not only male, that's me. There's some very evil woman out there, you know, that I've, I've driven by a different value system to you. And many things are going to feel unfair. But you know what? Maybe they win that unfair decision, but you'll come back and you'll try and don't quit. So that would be, remember, in the context of a corporate where the yeah. culture is done by the corporate, remember, in the, an entrepreneurial environment, you can become your own boss and therefore you've got the freedom to decide. But in a corporate, you don't. You have to abide by the values of that corporate. And you either you stay or you quit. You know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just bear that in mind. Thank you. So I'm taking notes. I don't know if the listeners are taking notes, but I'm taking diligent notes. And your answers are, are, are they different, but they're similar and they, they're super strong. Lots of beautiful nuggets there. Okay, question two. We've got nine to go. What? We've got nine to go. We've got nine to complete. Why is there a resistance to have more women in leadership roles? 
how do we close the pay gender gap, Lauren? Great. So, um, I mean, Monica's experience in this is more recent, um, but I'll share generally my perspective. I think that people are resistant to change in whatever format it comes. And so um, a lot of it, and I'm sure we'll talk later about like conscious versus unconscious bias, but um, as humans, we like being around people like us. And even though as senior people in an organization, we do know that the numbers back up diversity and that the bottom line does better when there's diverse perspectives delivering on it. But when we're thinking about our tribe at our level, making decisions together, I do think that you or a person can feel threatened by change coming in or even being taken over. Um, that was my experience in um, a, a corporate that I worked for where I didn't get promoted three years in a row and I eventually quit. And my boss just said, you won't get promoted. I was like, I've, I've had the highest um, performance rating. Three people are given this performance rating a year. Seven promotions mm -hmm. are given a year and I haven't been granted one of them. And he just said, you're not going to. I think you should leave. Um, oh and so that always stuck with me. He actually gave me some great advice. He said, always be externally validating yourself in the market so that when you really are victim to a circumstance like that, you understand it and you can go somewhere where you are valued. I think for someone who like really likes fighting for change, that was actually quite hard for me because I was like, hell no, I want to change from the inside. Like, um, mm -hmm. But unless you are already in a position where you have some power, which I wasn't um, back then, um, the smarter thing for me to do was to go somewhere where I could progress and then also drive that change. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is that if your values are not in line with the, com the company you work for, you need to leave. It is not that your ego tells you to leave. It's common sense. You know, I remember uh, one of my jobs, I won't tell you which one, <laughs> when my boss said, you're working too hard, slow down. You know, we don't have enough money to print all the documents you're producing. I thought, what? When my personality, I'm a workaholic, I confess, when my personality becomes a liability to the company, I thought, I'm in the wrong job. So that went out quick, very quickly. So. That's exactly what Lauren did. You know, when you saw that these people were so biased and so blatantly telling you, you're not going to promote you. Of course you have to go. It's like, really, where am I working? And for what, you know? Can I, can I, I where you valued? Yeah. Just to interject, you, it's so powerful what you just said, because the same is, you know, if you're in a relationship, let's say a romantic relationship and your values are not aligned, what do you do? You get out. Yeah. But why yeah. are some people getting stuck? It's great how you just said that, yeah. Yeah, I think because also, I think the key problem in humanity is that we don't know who we are. So we don't know what our values are. How many of you have written down what are things that you are not negotiable? You know, like in my relationship with my husband, it's like, if you have an affair, trust me, that's that, that's the end. If you hit me, let's say, if you touch me with one finger, you know, because you're angry, that's the end. You know, so there's certain things that are not negotiable and you have to verbalize that you have to discuss it in a, part, in a relationship. And the same for the company you work for. If there's something that they are doing that is not aligned to your value system, run. If the values are aligned, then whatever you do eventually, you will break that glass ceiling because you don't remember there's a glass ceiling. You just carry on being who you are. You know, I, I'll give you a quick example. In, in When I was in auditing, my salary was so terrible, you know, that I was auditing the books of someone, a bookkeeper that was doing a mess, and I was fixing the books. She was earning 10 times more than me. I would go to the partner and say, what the hell? You are screwing me. So every six months, I would knock at the door of HR partner to say, what? You're screwing me. So that's the other thing. I can assure you that men do that all the time. I did it because I, I didn't... I, for me, it was unfair. It was like, what the hell? And I, every six months, I had my salary review. You know, if you don't do it, they won't do it. Even at straight, when I was the CEO, I had to fight for two years to work out a, a compensation plan, a long-term incentive, a bonus incentive, 
it, it took two years to get this bloody thing approved. Why? Because, like Lawrence says, the unconscious bias, the fact that it was run by a woman, and my expo was mainly women. So I really think that they could not tolerate the fact that I was asking for all these incentive plans. And eventually they had to get used to it, and eventually they approved it. So what I'm saying is don't be shy, ask. And if they, like Lauren happened that she asked and they said, forget it, then move, you're in the wrong place. So right, I've always said the thing, ask what's the worst that can happen, but ask. Okay, let's go on to question three, thank you. Do we, out of necessity, have to design leadership programs for women or must we treat women the same as men leaders? What are your thoughts? I can go on this one first. Okay. I'm yeah, convinced that women are different. We are totally different. We are emotional. We really are emotional. We have, most of us want to get married and have babies, you know? So you want to work for a company that will absolutely not see that as a negative, but accommodate you. You're different, you know? And therefore, I do believe that we need, the, that the company must be sensitized, the company not women, the whole company must go through a process of sensitization. I'll give you an example. I sit on the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council of Consensus. You know, close to 80% of the people that work for Consensus are white male, and we have people from all over the world. How did that happen? When we did the research, we realized that it was in the recruiting process that the questions were biased towards a man, and the panel was all men. So of course, like Lauren said, they're going to choose someone that is like them. So we need to do courses to sensitize men also about sexual harassment. You know, there, there's some courses that clearly shows that men don't realize that the way they talk and the way they treat us, it's unacceptable. And they think it's, it's cool, it's okay, it's not okay. And that's why we really need a sensitization course for men about how to treat us and how to accommodate us and how to know that we have different needs to the ones that they have. And then we need to learn, you know, I love this a book that says, uh, Lessons That I Learned um, From Men um, by Donald Rachelson. And she wrote a book that was magnificent because she proves that if we learn some of the things that men do, we can be more successful. Um, you, know, uh, you know, like for example, men ask for salary increases all the time. We should do that too. Uh, then you, I'm sure you read the book Lean In. Lean In uh, yeah. uh, by Sheryl Sandberg. It's brilliant. Yeah. When you sit at the table, don't sit at the back. You know, I always sit next to the chairman or in the chair. I sometimes get told by the chair, no. <laughs> yeah. I'm right you know? in the front. Yeah. No, right in the front, yeah. next to the chair. Even at varsity, I would sit right in the front so I could ask the questions, you know? So make yourself heard, make yourself seen. Also, the way you dress, I love the red jacket uh, that Lauren is working is wearing because, yes, wear bold colors. Don't wear black. Black is terrible. You know, yes, black like this, but wear colors that people will see you at the boardroom because, you know what, if not, you become transparent, you know, and you shouldn't be transparent. The more bold, the more you know, um, noisy you are. You know, like people will say, when you are in a room with Monica, you always know she's there, you know? So don't be shy, talk, speak your mind, you know? Don't let men, ah, because that's the other thing that men do. You, tell, you say something on the board and guess what? It gets ignored. But then one of the male board members takes exactly what you said, in different words, but the same principle, and that gets approved. You know, many times I would say, Mr. Chairman, I said that. Why is it that now it's approved? So my chair, you know, we had a deal with my chair that if he touched my hand in the board meeting, it means Monica Shara talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> because really, what the hell? You know, bring, bring it to the attention of a board meeting, you know, that what this man is doing is unacceptable. Or many times they're going to try to make you feel lesser than, don't tolerate it. At the board meeting say, with respect, Mr. Chairman, don't talk to the person, to the chair. I find this comment unacceptable and blah, 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 blah. So if you understand this boldness, this endurance, this, I take no prisoners and I'm not going to tolerate anyone 
to actually make me feel lesser than. Okay. Uh, be beautiful, and I love how you bring your stories. It really just brings it home. So for you, Lauren, what do you say? Do we out of necessity have to design leadership programs for women or must we treat women the same as men leaders? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I agree with what Monica said. Women are different creatures and, you know, whatever we're trying to progress through, we often emulate people ahead of us. And because there are more men in senior positions, often we end up trying to emulate how a man has become successful, how they lead, how they make decisions. And, um, and so Monica, I think you and I probably have similar energies in the way that we would, you know, dominate in a boardroom. But from running a community like Future Females, where there's huge diversity in the type of personalities by women, I've also seen that be quite detrimental for someone. Um, we've got this concept called like the Batman and the Robin, and the Batman being kind of the male dominant energy, you know, the decision maker, someone who is going to speak up and be like, wait, have you heard me? I'm wearing a freaking bright orange jacket. How could you ignore this? But there are also people whose personality types, sorry, I'm getting emphatic and my hair's coming up. Um, there are people who are the Robins and they have a quiet confidence and can dominate with a whole different and probably more feminine energy. And for someone like that, trying to emulate a, a man in leadership is probably going to do them more harm than good because they might get to that role. But my gosh, will they find it draining? So. I believe that both formal and informal programs specifically designed for women are needed. Formal that actively showcase how women, feminine energies, different personality types can lead successfully. So you see a whole range of different role models. But then also informally, because what men have is golfing, they have cycling. And I almost sound insane saying this, but we as women need to recreate that informal leadership system between ourselves as well and realize that promotion is not as, you know, it's as much your work being done as you speaking for yourself and building those interpersonal relationships and the trust that comes with that. So hell yes from me. <laughs> I'm loving this energy. I just have to tell you, I really hope that it's, it's a pity we can't have other people partaking and saying, loving this, doing this like we can in our meetings, but I'm sure that we'll get lots of positive feedback from this, but loving this so far. So let me jump on to the next question. So I can see we're going to run out of time here in questions, but this question says, what is the skill set required for women leaders in the future in order to be recognized in the working environment? Would you feel that this is a different question now or would you feel that you have already answered that? Lauren, I'd like you to go first on that one. Perfect. Um, to be recognized. I think that it's I think that it's quite tough. There's the technical skill set and there's the personal skill set. So, um, uh, <laughs> there's so many things, right? I see like general leadership skills, management skills, strategy skills. Um, a lot of them, sorry, my puppy's trying to take my jacket off as we so speak. So cute. <laughs> Bring the puppy in. Bring the puppy in. Yeah, also a woman. Very excited about this conversation. Um, yeah, I think that there's a diverse and, and ever evolving skill set. And, you know, probably in a business like blockchain, Monica can speak to this even more. Yeah. So, what do you think, Monica? Well, I, I can tell you, you know, I'm a chartered accountant and being a CA, it was a big deal. You know, I, um, I graduated in yeah. the 80s so my, um, and it was, wow, you know, once you're a CA, the world is your oyster. And it's true. It was like that. But not anymore. If I tell you that I'm consensus, I'm like the last, you know, person in the company, you know, in terms of uh, being successful or knowledgeable or it's made up, first of all, it's made up of um, people that are age group between 25 and 40, number one. Number two, they're all techies. Um, number three, they don't care about an accountant. Accountants are like, who are you? You know? So I am just concerned that um, we're not changing um, fast enough our educational standards. Uh, I'll give you an example. What are accountants graduate without knowing how to program? How are you going to mm -hmm. read a code? to audit the computer code if you don't know how to program. Our educational oh. step more mathematical based because in future, everything would be mathematics. 
So to have uh, reduced the standards of mathematics in South Africa, we made a massive mistake. We are making a huge disservice to the students. They become, um, they have a false sense of security thinking, oh, I've got my trick or I finished university, but they're not qualified for the new workplace. I have to assure you that everything I know at the moment in blockchain, I didn't go to university. I've learned from the internet. You don't need a Harvard degree to, to be able to work. You just need to be disciplined and you have all the courses available even for free in the internet. You can spend 24 seven the whole year just learning from the internet. And that's how I acquired my knowledge of blockchain. So there are no excuses. You don't even need nice. money, be disciplined. Yeah. But you need yeah. discipline, learning the new um, uh, educational uh, tools that are going to be required in this new internet of value and the world that is without frontiers. And that will require understanding of computer technology in many, many ways. And the only way to learn is the internet and by using it. You know, have you bought any cryptocurrency? Have you downloaded a, a wallet? Have you have have you you know applied um, you know any of this knowledge in in any industry to comprehend how blockchain will affect everything? And we are not doing mm -hmm. that. People are still mm -hmm. thinking it will never happen. And this is yeah. like the internet. You know, I'm old enough to know when the internet started. We, you know, how many people at that time said, "I will never touch a computer." <laughs> I promise you, I was 20 when this happened, and people were saying, "I'm not going to touch computers." You can't survive today, you know, without a computer or a, or, or, or a cell phone, a, a smartphone, impossible. And this is going to become more and more sophisticated. So you're not going to be able to get away from having to learn uh, these new um, techniques, um, social media, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I really believe that we are falling behind. Yeah. Thank you. You both share such interesting um and from your experience. So I'm gonna to jump to Lauren. Lauren, there was a question for you, then I'm gonna to jump to you, Monica, there was a question for you. So Lauren, why is Future Females a side hustle before going big? Being a leader is one thing, being an entrepreneur is another. What gave you the confidence in a male dominating, dominated world to do your own thing? Great, thank you. Um, so it was a side hustle to another business. Um, for my co-founder, it was a side hustle to her, her main job. So, I mean, we started this business because we needed it. Um, I moved to Cape Town. I ended up working for um, Techstars, one of the world's largest tech accelerators. We brought 10 companies from all around the world to co-locate, co-live in Cape Town. It was an amazing experience, but not a single female founder out of all of these businesses. And so I had just moved to the country. This was my first exposure to the startup ecosystem. And I was like, what the F? Like, this is just not okay. And having come from male dominated environments as well, I guess I was just like, this has, I have to do something about this now. Like this has to be my calling. And it kind of lit that fire inside me. So I guess what gave me the confidence to start is that I didn't want to live in a world where I hadn't started it. I needed what I was creating. I needed um, to build the community for myself because I was literally like, I don't have colleagues, friends, role models. I felt very alone, which I think is the journey for a lot of entrepreneurs, but also women in leadership who don't necessarily have people above and around them. Um, so yeah, I think that's what gave me the impetus to start. I think that confidence is definitely something that I've built over time. And, you know, what I like to always fall back on is commitment over motivation. I have committed to this vision and this is no longer about me. Like I'm not going to not show up on social media because I don't feel like I'm looking good that day. I've committed to my community that I'm going to do it. And therefore I will, I'm not going to be like, oh, I don't feel like it because I often don't feel like it. Let's be honest. Um, so I think that keeps me going. I've had some really, really hard times, of course, everyone does in, in corporate or in entrepreneurship, times where things I've put a lot of time and energy into have just fallen completely flat. And I think what's helped me at those points is to, you know, two things. One, 
it's about the vision. And so I always try to be committed to what it is I'm working towards, which really is gender equality at its highest level, not to how I'm trying to get there. And so I try to take these failures as redirections um, and, and use that perspective. Um, and then, yeah, the second thing that just works for me is when we were talking about values, one of my highest values is play. And so I feel if you take a, a positive energy of playfulness, I even have a play button tattooed on my wrist because it's that important to me. If you can take that energy into what you're doing, then it doesn't matter if you don't achieve the overnight success because no one does. You are happy to take the three, five, 10 years that it takes to build something truly great because you're enjoying most of the steps of the process. Beautiful. Hey, it's not it's not the destination, it's the journey. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, you know, I, I don't want this webinar to end. Are you feeling the same way? <laughs> <laughs> Monica, you somebody said, Monica, you are the most inspirational inspirational woman I have met. How do you find time and energy to balance work and home? what's the secret and when we started the webinar you knew this question was coming this is your moment to take it away and share with us souls out there <laughs> well i don't have any balance what are we talking about let's be honest it's a it's a figment of someone's imagination a balance maybe the younger generation but just remember baby boomers we were programmed to work hard you know we were obsessed about working hard and and making money and saving and and we also very much into our generation is the one that bought the big houses the big cars the, the traveling everything was excess you know um the you know the chanel suits the jewelry the louis Vuittons, all that it was absolute obsession with excess um which i don't see that happening in the younger generation thanks god and therefore that comes at a price you know, when you start accumulating assets, you know, if you have many properties around the world, ah, guess what? Administration. There's no balance. And then you also want to have your kids because you want to have it all. Guess what? Zero balance. So the only thing that, um, you know, I was always scared because I had the children and I, and I gave presentations all my life about, yes, you can have it all. You can be a working woman, you can be a mom and your kids are going to be fine. I used to come home and I say to the kids, kids, listen, you need to be normal. Don't turn out to be alcoholics or drug addicts because I'm giving speeches to say that you can be a good mom and a good leader and a CEO of a company. Thank God they turn out to be fine. But they kept on saying, no pressure, mom, thanks. You know? So what, what was the key? The key is, number one, they knew that I loved what I was doing. So even though I used to travel a lot, I, I traveled the world because I wanted to give speeches around the world about what we were doing. So I wasn't there for the ballet, for the rugby, for the whatever. So and sorry so, to interject. I have huh? to share this because I've known I've known Monica for many years. Yeah. Guys listening in, Monica was traveling three weeks of the month out in <laughs> from from China to wherever to the UK yeah. to Europe. Three weeks of a month, one week at home. I just want to give you yeah. guys perspective. <laughs> yeah, so I missed out on everything. I missed out on graduations, on birthdays, everything. Okay, so you would think my kids should be screwed up, but they were not because they knew that I loved that, number one. And when I was home, I was 100% home. You know, I was, you know the, the, the commitment to these children was, you know, in the same way that I was committed to my job, I was committed to them, but they knew they had to share me and they knew that the balance was 80% work, 20% kids, no? And I had a good um, structure. You know, my ex-husband was a good father, a terrible husband, but a good father. So he took you know, <laughs> the responsibility of raising them better than me, you know? So thanks God, they fine, you know? But let me confess, the bitches of the school, the mothers that don't work, they kept on saying, oh, we missed you at the ballet yesterday. Oh, you didn't attend this school meeting. Yeah, and you're not part of the talk show. Not to help. You know what I did? I joined the board of the school because I could uh, contribute in the board better than in the talk show. You see what, my point? So what I'm saying is that I confess I had no balance, but the kids turned out just fine. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. 
Rebecca. Thank you. All right, being, I hope everybody's okay. We probably go a little bit over time. And I was just given a question here. Uh, how do we overcome gender biases in the workplace? If you can give us a short, quick answer, both of you, how do we overcome gender biases in the workplace? Lauren? Mm, quick answer, communication. I mean, Monica was speaking about knowing ourselves, but we also know each other. Um, and that comes from, you know, as a woman, authentically communicating our needs and wants and decisions and a man receiving that. And actually women to women as well, Monica was saying, sometimes we can be each other's worst enemies. Um, and I think that really just comes down to knowing and trusting and supporting each other. Thank you. Monica, how do we overcome gender biases in the workplace? So for me, it's, uh, I have this motto, transparency is the best disinfectant. Okay? <laughs> so uh, I wish I was more polite in the way I did things. I was never polite. So I, I created a lot of enemies because imagine that someone is now being biased and I would then at the board meeting say, what the hell? What was that about? You know, like really brutally, I would say that comment was totally biased against women or you're not attacking me personally. You know, at the board meeting, I would bring it to their attention. So um, I totally agree with Lauren. If you are um, more polite and polished than me, you should do it in a nice way, you know? And, but definitely when you see that something is not working or something is, um, you know, there's a glass ceiling or there's bias against you or the attitude or the sexual harassment, immediately, don't wait, immediately, put it on the table in a nice politically correct, you know, they sent me to uh, learn how to talk because I used to be so brutal. So I had to learn to say, I feel that you never got, you, you go, I feel that that was not acceptable because in this company, our values conflict with what you just done. You know, so you learn to say it in a politically correct, unless you lose your cool and you tell him to fuck off. Sorry for the word. But what I'm saying is that it gets to a point that sometimes, you know, all the politeness, goes out of the window when things are really blatantly uh, wrong. But I totally believe that we need to be on the lookout, be aware of our conscious bias, that like, all of these things haven't left um, the workplace. So mm. the more communication and the more debates we have about it, you could even have a meeting to say, what was that about? Can we download? Can we do, you know, sign sharing? Yes. You know so, you know, I wasn't the greatest at communication because I was brutal, but at least I knew that I brought consciousness so that I'd make sure that those things wouldn't happen. Beautiful, thank you. I uh, We've got two minutes till the end, but we're just gonna go, like I said, a little bit over. I will, I, will end, I will end with this final question to both of you. So what is your final suggestion, advice, or tip to our audience today? Um, so what is your final suggestion, keeping in with regard to this as empowering females, in 2022? Mm. Lauren. Great. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll actually just share with you, I do a lot of affirmations. It's probably the only part of my morning routine that I have stuck with <laughs> over the last 10 years, but the affirmation does change depending on where I am in my life. So currently something that I say to myself every morning and it's the screensaver on my phone, I'll, I'll share with you. And it's a quote, um, and it is, those who were dancing were thought insane by those who couldn't hear the music. And mm. I love this so much because for me, the music is your true authentic soul, that purpose that is driving you. And I feel like if you can wake up every day and hear that music and dance to it, then you're already in the right place. It's when you're trying to dance to someone else's, sorry, my puppy really wants to join this webinar. I feel like she could join this last question. Um, you know, I've been in positions in my life where I've tried to dance to someone else's beat and copy them because it's worked for them or done what is expected of me and just really not being happy. And the biggest success for my life has just come from being the most true to myself. So um, I guess that's what I would share and hope for some of you tuned in that resonates as well. Beautiful, be an original, be yourself. Monica, what's your final suggestion, advice or tip for our audience today? As you can see, what we've been discussing today uh, with Lauren all the time is that you need to know who you are and what drives you. And, and you need to visualize 
what you want. And, you know, I always say that everything that I wish for has come true, even the things I didn't wish for, but they come because of I had to learn a lesson. But what I'm saying is that in terms of the things that I did wish for, they came through because of visualization, of believing in myself, of my passion, and because it came from my heart. Um, if you're driven by your ego, that's going to be a little bit more complicated. And then don't be surprised if you know if you don't achieve what you want to achieve. But if, when the when the objectives are um, pure, I think the universe conspires to uh, help you. Um, and then, as I said, endurance. Don't give up. Um, you know, and yeah, that's that's my meaning. Beautiful, wonderful. Well, in trying to keep in time, it's one o'clock on the dot. I would have said let's do a sum up and a closing, but I have a feeling that we could take that into a little bit more time. And I'm conscious about people. This is a working day for them. This is kind of a lunch break for a lot of people. So uh, I will give you an opportunity to say one word, one sentence in final closing. But before you do that, I just want to take an opportunity to thank you both so much. I feel so pumped <laughs> and inspired mm -hmm. from how and what you have shared that uh, it's, it's just beautiful. And it was really important. And there were some magnificent uh, nuggets. And I thank you for that. And before I get you to do your little closing bits, remember in the beginning I said I, w I wanted to share with you something? <laughs> this is me sharing with you. This was my first time today to facilitate a session like that. Normally I'm on the other side and I was invited by I learned to facilitate this session. And obviously now I've experienced on both sides, it's quite different. I facilitate coaching and group sessions is different, but the webinar, big thing, mm -hmm. big growth. I was tiny nervous. I wonder if anybody could tell, but I always say mm -hmm. this, <laughs> grow wherever something puts you out of your comfort zone, do it. That's the growth and we need to constantly mm -hmm. grow. And mm -hmm. I've learned to trick my brain and I teach my clients trick your brain that nervousness is excitement. So you get excited about that. But closing off to you, what's your final words? Lauren first, Monica after. Um, I mean, firstly, Karina, no, you couldn't tell your nerves at all. You're incredibly organized, so thank you. Um, I think I just, you know, everyone who's tuned in, hopefully you've learned something. Um, I think that, you know, being constantly opening to learning from whoever it is in entrepreneurship, I had to unlearn a lot of what I thought I learned, my ego, to be able to relearn how to do things the right way in, in this new context. So I just want to celebrate that and encourage all of you to, to keep having that mindset to everything that you do. Beautiful. Thank you. Monica. A hundred percent, Lauren. That's my passion, lifelong learning. That's why I became a professor. That's why I want to teach. I want to tell the world how they can empower themselves through education, number one. But number two, life is not fair. So don't be a victim. When stuff happens to you, dust it off and say, what is the lesson that it's bringing me? And that confront it. And then, you know, don't give up and you will find a, a way. There are so many books that have inspired me all through my life because I really had a tough life. And it was all about that when the challenges come, you come, you look at them and you say, okay, what is it that I need to learn and how I'm going to get out of this? But you can't give up. So it's really endurance, what I think is um, a gift and hope and faith that um, we we can use as tools to be able to um, to have a happy life. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. I'm Personally, going to take all my notes, all my three pages I took from you today and retype them, remap them. And isn't it wonderful? This I, I Learn is the company's name, I Learn, that's hosted this webinar. And you both said the thing is about learning. I think the company chose the name really beautifully about I Learn. So thank mm. you. We've learned a lot mm. from you today. Um, bless you both. If I could be in person, I'd hug you so big and tight because I'm a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to wish you both fabulous rest of this day we can't believe we're going into september and and thank you can't thank you enough thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you everybody yeah. thank you Lauren. thank you, also you. Thank you Karina. <laughs> we are now all bound from all the three of us and from the group of people that were listening and the people who will be listening forever so thank you for that thank you for inspiring us keep on doing it we'll be watching you thank you keep well so everybody well. Bye-bye.